What's up, everybody? Welcome to On The Clock, our very first episode of it. On The Clock is presented by Blitzelix, where analytics meet scouting and you meet the newest crop of outfield, off-field talent. Don't think I did that as good as Jack, but here we go. Um, this is our first ever episode. Like I said, we're happy to meet you guys. I'm Zachary Garten. You'll find me at All22Addict on Twitter, and I'm with my good friend, Roy Countryman. Go ahead and introduce yourself, Roy. Hey, thanks, Zach. Glad to be uh, on the case here with you, starting a new scouting podcast here for Blitz. Uh, couldn't have picked a better co-host here. We're going to be having some guests frequently on and off and 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 just getting ready to get into the gist of everything here, the, the scouting season. We're going to be highlighting a bunch of different stuff here today in the news section, but uh, it doesn't mean that we're not going to also be getting to know each other a little bit more here for all our listeners and and maybe enlightening them to some of the things maybe they don't know about the scouting process. So I can't wait to get into it. Um, I love the layout. Got to give a big shout out to my man at Rob Rob Graphics, uh, Robert Robertson. He's the guru of of putting all this layout together. He always makes us look a lot better than I think maybe we're qualified to be. Um, so big thanks to him. Um, I'm gonna get it back to you, Zach. We'll go ahead and kick this episode off. All right, sounds good. So. First thing we're going to do is just get a quick rundown of what we're doing today. We're going to go into our backgrounds. Roy first, of course, because he's the more accomplished one here. And then we'll go into me. Then we're going to go ahead and talk about what we're planning to do with the show and everything there. Then we're going to go eventually into some football stuff. We'll be talking about the conference ch- championship games. We'll be talking about my kind of big board for the opt-outs I've watched so far. If you follow me on Twitter, you've kind of seen me go through all these opt-outs. I'm up to 15 now, so we'll go over that a little bit and some of our thoughts. Then the Senior Bowl roster was revealed today, so we're going to be talking about all those guys and some of our favorite guys on the list and some of the guys we wish were on that list as well. And who knows, maybe they'll get on later in the year. But that's kind of our rundown for the show today. And Of course, if you guys hop on with some questions, we'll answer some of those as well. So we're going to go ahead and get into our backgrounds. Roy, we've got some questions here for you. I've already written them down. You've answered them. <laughs> on the outline so feel free to go ahead and into that all right zach this is I, i'm not a big person that likes to toot my own horn or talk about my own journey but uh since everybody's kind of we're starting this thing off the right way uh i do thank you for for throwing that out there i am maybe a little bit more accomplished that doesn't mean any more skilled because uh, some of the stuff i've seen you throw out there in a short amount of time you have a, a lot of talent here and, and it's i'm excited to see this journey go forward but for me, it really started off, uh, I've always been a draft nerd per se, uh, ever since, uh, I don't know, first draft, uh, I'd say I started writing up players with maybe 98, 2000, but haven't really did it as a, a full-time gig type thing. Um, it was always more of a hobby. One of my favorite players ever to watch was Antoine Randwell when he was quarterbacking for Indiana uh, before my Steelers took him, lost my mind when the Steelers actually took him and made him a receiver. Um, but... <laughs> Then uh, did uh, after getting married uh, early on here in life, and me and my wife discussed some things, and I, I took the SMWW course to kind of help get my journey started off here. Took the scouting and GM course. Um, had some great people there to learn under, under the tutelage of uh, Mark Dominic, and uh, especially one of my close friends now, mentors, Russ Landy. Uh, they helped set me up with a lot of networking opportunities. So uh, it was nice to get into there. I graduated from that, and... Um, just for my work that I did there uh, during the course, Russ Landy actually offered me an internship with his company. Um, at that time, it was GM Junior Scouting. Um, he was one of the first ones to actually start media scouting, per se, uh, when he was in and out of working for teams because he has worked for quite a few many NFL, CFL. And the first go-around, not the last year, but the first go-around, the XFL, he also helped uh, scout some there. Uh, but I, I worked with him for about two or three years. Um, then he got hired on by a CFL team, kind of put his on the back burner. And he referred me to a company called Blitzalytics. Uh, that was a bunch of uh, people that took his course and that he was really impressed with. And started here just as a scout. And then last year kind of took the reins as the director of scouting here now. And um, had a lot of success here so far. Can't wait to see what we're going to build in the future. Uh, they they helped me release one of my uh, big things I've always wanted to accomplish, which was a project it's been working on for about 10 years, was the Prospect Encyclopedia. Uh, I'm sure a lot of our listeners already know a lot about that. Oh, yeah. And uh, the link's in the actual information here. It's a great resource for getting to know all players. You should buy yeah. it. Yeah. And um, not only that, 
uh, uh, something I know me and you both can relate upon. Um, I was really proud also of our XFL and AAF coverage here with Blitz. Um, but I was one of the main people with Rob Rob and also David Connors uh, to start and cover the XFL very thoroughly. Jack Bourgeois was also in on it. Uh, but we did, the first time around, we did an entire coverage of the whole live draft, which was like eight hours straight on YouTube. And uh, it was it was pretty, I, I was pretty proud of that moment to be able to have oh, information yeah. on them players and, and get them to know who they are a little bit. So, uh, you know, I don't like talking about myself, but we have, we've had some success here. Uh, you know, I always like talking about we, not me, because, you know, if any mm -hmm. of you guys are, are succeeding, then I'm succeeding. And, you know, I, I try to keep my, my, my ideas out of it as, as much as I can. I let the, uh, the uh, people that have the skills also make me look good. So that's pretty much my background. Um, what do you say about you, Zach? What, what's your background? So, um, well, you talk about we. You had a lot of help on the way. I don't, I'm not going to – I'm going to be honest. I haven't had a ton of help on the way once I get into this media thing. Um, but I well, grew up – I didn't know about football till like, I legit did not know what football <laughs> was. My mom tried to shield me from it until I was probably uh, eight or nine years old. I remember I was stuck with my un aunt and uncle in Pennsylvania, my – uncle was a huge Washington Redskins fan and he introduced me to football and that's where I first started um, getting in love with it I became a Panthers fan still am for the most part the Cam divorce kind of <laughs> hurt that a little bit because Cam Newton's one of my favorite players of all time but I grew up loving Jake Delhomme and Steve Smith you can see the Steve Smith picture other side <laughs> over here and um, I grew up loving him and those guys are what really got me into football I grew up playing Madden first didn't start playing um, football till about fifth or fourth or fifth grade. I think it was fifth grade. And then eventually played through high school, got into a D3 college, played for two years before I destroyed my shoulder. Then I moved on, realized that, hey, you know what? Maybe playing's not for me. So I decided to start getting into the media thing. Started with the AAF, um, covered the San Diego fleet there. It was a really good time, a lot of hard work. I was kind of one of the lead guys for a small little online publication down in um, San Diego. Put in a lot of work there. It was a ton of fun. Then that folded, and I was like, well, crap. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll just wait and see what happens next. I kind of took a little bit of a step back, watched a lot of NFL stuff, um, was just kind of learning more about the game at that point. And then the XFL came around, and I was like, you know what? I didn't do this with the AF, but I want to try to start a podcast. Um, was a ton of fun, the Guard Post podcast. Got a nice little group following going interacted with other podcasts, got a couple interviews with a couple really good um, guys that I still talk to from time to time, really great um, guys on the Guardians. And then, of course, the XFL went bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of my luck with Spring League, so I'm happy the NFL stuck around a little bit longer since I've decided <laughs> to cover it. Uh, it got close with COVID, you know, as soon as I started, you know what, I'm going to cover the NFL draft. COVID hit, and I was like, of course. <laughs> So we'll kind of just wait and see what happens there. But I'm hoping this sticks around a little bit longer, and it's been a ton of fun. I really appreciate Blitz Lakes for having me as a scout and giving me the chance to really take the next step in doing what I love. Yeah, it's it, and we kind of have a similar background because, you know, I'm, I'm actually somebody that never played football at any level. Um, and and it's, it, was a, it was a reason, a family thing, kind of like you say, like your mom kind of shielded you from it. Mine was my dad. Um, he was always afraid I'd get hurt, which if you ever see me in person, you'd always be like, what? Because uh, I'm about <laughs> six three, six four, uh, about three hundred pounds. I'm a big, I'm a big pulling guard, and uh, I always got a lot of flack from that from my buddies because they always wanted me to play. But uh, I could thank him now. Uh, God rest his soul. He passed away a few years ago. Uh, but I, I don't think I would have the drive to want to scout players if I would actually play it. I think I would have got burned out. But uh, the, the XFL, I'm the same way. I'm a sucker for a spring league. I don't care when it comes back in 2022. Mm -hmm. You're gonna catch me watching and, and and processing, and we're gonna oh, yeah. be breaking down stuff. I'm already I'm already looking forward to that, Zach. Whenever that time comes, oh, yeah. it'll be a, it'll uh, be fun. Hopefully, I'm a little wary just because of my luck in the past. But we're gonna have to wait and see. Maybe I'll start up the guard post again if the Guardians are still around. It was definitely a really fun time to be able to do that. It's just gonna be kind of a wait and see thing for me because of what happened last time. But we're here with the on the on the clock podcast. We're scouting. We're talking about college and the NFL. Those aren't going anywhere. We've kind of seen that through COVID. They're going to stick around no matter what. So if we're going to talk about scouting, let's talk about some of our pet peeves. I'll let you go ahead and start. You had a lot more listed than me. So <laughs> what are some of your scouting pet peeves uh, since we're getting each other to know each other's value? All right. So for me, I have a few of them. Um, 
One of them is whenever you hear an evaluator, you know, uh, let me first preface this by saying draft Twitter, let's stop crapping on each other. We're all in this the same, you know, situation here. We're not working for an NFL team. You got to uplift each other. Whether you're right or wrong, nobody's batting a thousand when you're scouting. You know, it's almost like uh, Major League Baseball. You'd be in the Hall of Fame if you hit three out of ten. Uh, most of the time, you only get seven picks in the draft. And most teams only hit maybe two. So, um, just look ahead to that a little bit and realize it doesn't really pay off to be beaten up on each other. Uplift each other, make each other better, you know, have constructive criticism. But getting back to pet peeves here, quarterback play. I hate it when people just say, <laughs> cop out with arm talent. Explain to me what arm talent is. Like, can you d- sum it up in like three <laughs> words or maybe one sentence? Like, it would be basically your description of Jamarcus Russell. Oh, he has great arm talent. Okay, well, I mean, I can throw 50 yards from my knees, but that doesn't mean I can pinpoint accurate, you know, 50 yards down the field. He couldn't even hit the broad yeah. side of a barn. Um, so <laughs> arm talent to me is one, and also arm strength. Uh, arm strength is one of the most overrated features. Not saying there's certain systems like Bruce Arians who likes throwing the vertical routes and they enjoy having a guy with a big arm and a cannon. But people that value strictly arm strength over accuracy and touch and ball placement just drives me absolutely insane, uh, especially with the proliferation of all the short game and the the inside routes, as you've seen New England won for the last decade with, with Wes Welker and Julian Edelman, you know, Peyton Manning. I cannot stand <laughs> people just valuing arm talent or using that. It just it, To me, it's a cop-out or a lazy way of describing a quarterback. And I, I want to see more description whenever uh, people are doing it like that. So that's my first pet peeve. Yeah. I'll maybe let you throw out a couple here, and then I'll get back to a couple yeah. of mine. So one of mine is kind of counteractive to yours, because when I've listed it down, I was like, this is one of my biggest things, especially in these like recent years with guys. Um, arm strength actually matters. We hear in a, I know you I know you think arm strength does matter. It's important. I just hate the guys completely devalue. I think Kyle Trask is a really good um, – topic when we talk about arm strength because like people will be like oh he has decent arm strength he throws down the field when i talk about arm strength i'm not just talking about oh he's able to throw it 50 yards down the field i'm talking about velocity on short-term throws as well when we talk about kyle trask and i've seen a lot of people talk about this i've been one of them his ball floats a lot and that to me is a sign of lack of arm strength because he's not able to put that zip on it to fit in those tight windows and arm strength really matters to me because when we value When we devalue arm strength, which I say the greatest sin of 2014 Peyton Manning is causing people to not value arm strength because not everybody can be the smartest QB in the world with no arm. Some of these guys just have no arm. (laughs) So when we talk about Kyle Trask of the world and the Mac Jones, because I think he does struggle with velocity at times, and guys in that vein, people tend to value them because, oh, they're accurate. Oh, they have, they make plays in the pocket. Oh, they're smart. And I'm like, but can they make all the throws? And the answer most of the time is no, because they don't have the requisite arm strength to fit in all these tight windows, especially down the middle of the field where everything's tighter and everything's faster. They can't make those throws down the middle of the field because they don't have the arm strength to do so. And that's kind of one of my pet peeves is seeing that. Like, oh, hey, this guy can make all the throws because he has the arm to throw at 50 yards down See, the field. I, I, but you said something key, and that's one uh, the one thing I want to point out. There's a difference to me between arm strength and velocity. And that's what I think a lot of people get, you know, kind of confused with is I could have arm strength. I could get, you know, four steps and throw it 60 yards. But can I take a good balanced approach, transfer my weight and zip the ball in 15 yards down the field? That's what I'm talking about whenever arm strength is overrated. Velocity, I'm with you 100 percent. Velocity to me, I always rank and weight more than I do pure arm strength. If I can see a guy hit, hit, hit a receiver on a 15 or 12, 15 yard post and put it right on the numbers, and it's not floating, it's tight spiral. You know, Peyton Manning was like that. He didn't have the greatest arm, but he had good velocity in those intermediate routes. And that's intermediate strength and velocity is more important, I think, than deep ball strength because that's the way you're going to win the majority of your routes is in the intermediate area. You're only going to throw the ball, what, maybe eight times a game at most, past 20 yards, Um, and and, and that's where you're going to need. You need that short to intermediate. Intermediate is where you're going to make your money. Uh, for that, but yeah, I, I get what you're saying. I, you know, kind of counterintuitive, but it's it's there. I, I understand what you're yeah. saying. Velocity more than arm strength is one of mine. Um, I'll throw out here another one. 
is um, people calling guys busts after year one. Um, <laughs> this is always one thing me and Russ always talked about. He always kind of, when I'd start talking about a guy that was kind of, you know, underperformed in year one, he's like, mm-hmm. yeah, but he might have came from a smaller school or, you know, this or that. And he's like, you can't just call a guy a bust after one year. Um, so to me, I always say at least three, if not four years. I mean, excuse me, there's always a reason why your guys, even on day three, get a three to four year contract. Oh, yeah. You know, if they're able to stick around for three years and they play, even on special teams, that's still a hit. You know, if you're going to have a guy oh, yeah. that's that's even an ascending player, if he's coming from a small school, don't call guys bust. And even after that, you know, I was very high on Josh Rosen. I'm not gonna. I'm yeah. not. I'm not willing to sit here right now and call him a bust yet. He's been in terrible situations, and that's one of the biggest reasons. Is you gotta almost look if a guy has been a per se bust or has been a letdown since he's been drafted. Was he out of the? Was he drafted to the wrong system to begin with? Is he gonna go to a change of scenery and actually go to somewhere that fits his talent skill? So to me. Don't call guys busts after one year. Yeah, you could say maybe they were let down. You thought you had maybe more expectations, especially in the first round. If you're a first-round pick, in my opinion, you need to be playing a significant amount of snaps. Whether yeah. you're a starter or not, you should at least be a rotational player. You know, I can get maybe saying, oh, he was a disappointment in year one, but don't don't go out and already make generalizations of saying a guy's a bust. And they, they even works for the opposite way, too. Don't call him a, a, you know, a boom after one year because – you know, we all know the NFL is a league of adjustments, and oh, yeah. guys, once they get about five, six game tapes on you, and defense coordinators have a whole off season to watch you, you get Lamar Jackson this year. So yeah, it, it's it they'll eventually adjust to you, and that's what makes you an NFL great player. Oh yeah, definitely. And I mean, if we're gonna keep doing pet peeves, my last one that I've got, and then we'll move on to something a little bit different here. We'll tweak the next topic, but. You got to admit when you're wrong at times, man. Like it's one of my, it's going to be a weird thing to say, but one of my favorite things I'm looking forward to once I get a couple draft class under my belt is looking back and be like, Oh, I was definitely wrong on that guy <laughs> because I can already tell you there's a couple guys I'm a little worried about. I'm looking, I'm like, Oh, my evaluation. Like I understand you got to be like very adamant about your guys. Like I feel like I'm right about this. This is what my guts tell me, but there's always that feeling in the back of your mind. I'm watching this guy. I'm like, this is how I feel, but I could definitely be wrong about him. <laughs> kind of thing so i'm definitely looking forward to looking back maybe two years from now and looking back like oh yep that's a guy i was wrong on or that's a guy i was wrong on you got to be able to admit when you're wrong especially in a business as results oriented as football especially the nfl because yeah you can be like oh my process was right and that's an important thing but when you're result oriented as this league is you got to be like my process was right but this guy i was definitely wrong on so you got to look back tweak your process a little bit maybe and figure out what happened there. But it's definitely one of my things I'm looking forward to. And I wish people on draft Twitter did it a little bit more, just admitting when you're wrong. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everybody in life is better if you just admit. You're never going to get better unless you admit defeat and you've yeah. you've been broken down. i got to throw out a little shade to my man Rob Rob. He's saying I'm looking like – I saw like, that in uh, the comments. <laughs> he's, I'm looking like uh, uh, injury Big Ben or in the – you know, I, I had COVID. So I'm just going to say that's why we've been delayed for two weeks. I'm just thankful to be healthy and be able to talk football again. I've been oh, yeah. uh, Zach can kind of test. I've been working on a document on and off because I've been uh, trying to get draft resources together, and for I haven't been able to sleep on and off because because of COVID. So, but just glad to be here. He also threw out there that uh, one of his pet peeves is people taking a victory lap when they're right, but they're not admit when they're wrong. And he just stole the words oh, yeah. from your from your mouth, time. and and that's. I just listened to a podcast the other day of two respected people. One was Russ Landy. I always try to listen to what he does because uh, he is a close friend. But he's was on a podcast with Matt Waldman, which if you've not yet uh, been associated Matt with Waldman's Matt Waldman, good. if you love offensive skill position players, you need to go read his stuff, watch his videos. They're great breakdowns. If you're somebody that's just getting into scouting, he is great, great content. They had an, an episode talking about – kind of front office personnel and, and people breaking into the media and, and what their advice is and what they'd like to see out of people. And it was a great episode. The link is actually in the information here. I put it in just so if anybody is starting out, they can go get that resource. You know, Hit the subscribe button to him. I'm sure he would appreciate it. I actually got to meet him down in Mobile about two years ago. I had uh, dinner with him. Really cool guy. Um, it helps you out whenever you need. But uh, 
one of their their topics on there was about media in a sense, especially draft Twitter, the way it's boomed in the last few years, them not being willing to say, I missed on a guy. You know, if you're never going to be wrong, how are you ever going to improve? And it, to me, it's, you can't, you know, take the beating on the chest of saying, I hit on this guy, I hit on this guy. Well, then you always have that troll that says, well, I read your other report about A, B, and C. You are way wrong mm-hmm. on them. Well, yeah, every, every NFL front office mm-hmm. is, is like that. You, you know, do you think Ryan Pace is happy he took Mitchell Trubisky over Patrick Mahomes <laughs> and Deshaun Watson? I'm pretty sure no. He probably has nightmares every night about it. So we're no better than them. Yes, they get paid a lot more than us, and that's what our dream is. But that just goes back to the fact of building each other up, learning from our mistakes, and keep moving forward. And the best thing to do when you admit your mistakes is you're able to also to go back to your process and look, rewatch the same tape that you already graded maybe two years down right. the line say, why did I not see that? Did you maybe watch one tape where he had an excellent game against poor competition? And then that set, set you up for down the road saying, Oh, I can overlook his pocket presence or I can overlook his, his accuracy to the interme- intermediate area or as a pass rusher. Oh, he, he looked, he looked really, really good and be able to win off the edge against, you know, a Mac conference type player. But whenever he went against a big 10, he wasn't able to bend the edge. They're a lot better, you know, with their striking location. He wasn't able to bull rush. He didn't have a variety of pass rushing moves. You know, there's a lot of reasons why people miss. And some of the reasons, like we said before, is also team specific fits. So you really oh. gotta take a step back when you evaluate players. You can really look and see if who's trending up per se, but you can't say a bust. You really gotta learn from your mistakes, make your process better, and just keep improving along the way, because none of us are perfect. And I'll just I'll, no. I'll I'll wrap this up if you want, and then we'll get to. I know one of our our topics, me and you talked about, yeah. was maybe throwing out some of our our guys we can pound our chest for and say I hit on, and and excuse me, some other guys that we can maybe rag on ourselves and laugh at ourselves for who we really liked. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, for me, I'm going to include these two maybe together. It's you know what makes me really angry about media scouting more than anything, and even I'll say some of the NFL. I have a feeling that a lot of these interns and the lower level people, they're not willing to be themselves. They're not willing to step out of the box and trust their gut on a player. They're not willing to go against the grain or throw out their predictions than the mass. And and for a lot of times, if you want to be a quality evaluator, you need to trust your eyes and your gut. Those are the two best things when you're evaluating players. That's why people get into the GM positions they are. That's why they get into the player personnel executive positions they have, team presidents, because they're guys that consistently hit on players, but they don't have a show-me, show-me approach. They're quiet, calm, demeanored people, go about their business. They learn from their mistakes. They move forward about it. And scouting, one thing I was drawn to it immediately, Zach, is Mm – one of the other things I do in life is I'm a lay pastor. So whenever I'm up front in a, in a congregation giving a sermon, you're trying to convey a message to somebody and convince them about something. Okay, You want to make them a believer about this particular thing by the time in the allotted amount of time you have. That's the same thing we do with scouting. You have an allotted amount of time, whether it's words, a video, whatever it may be, Whatever you're seeing is what you're trying to convey to whoever it is, whether it's a decision maker, whether it's us trying to convince the media or the people that are watching this video. You can have differing opinions amongst people too, and that's fine, especially among scouting, because I might like a player, you might hate it, we might watch the same tape, oh, yeah. but we're not going to know until three to four years from now. So, oh, yeah. And then after that, you get that same person three to four years from now, you go back and watch that tape like we just said. You learn from it, and you give that guy kudos and say, hey, you're right. I, I completely overlooked that. Okay. And then you both are better scouts for it in the end. So that's that's the one thing. Just have your own voice. Be willing to go against the grain. It's not saying you're a hot take guy because I cannot stand them guys. You're not Stephen A. Smith. You're not just <laughs> throwing stuff out there. No. You stand on it. If you see it and you write down in your notes and in your evaluations and it's something that you're willing to stand there against the grain – State your case. Go with it. And, you know, that might be a reason that, that gets you where you're at. You just stick with your convictions. And that's oh, the biggest piece of advice I can have for anybody that's starting off here. 
Oh yeah, definitely. I can definitely agree with that. It's something that I'm learning to do myself at times. Cause there's guys where I'm like, a lot of people like this guy, but I just don't see it. And it's learned to stick with that kind of that gut feeling you got. So we're going to move on here just a little bit. We're still talking about us as evaluators, but we're moving on to what our favorite positions to scout are. And I'll go ahead and start real quick. My two favorite positions to scouts, I've been very vocal about this on Twitter, are wide receiver and cornerback. It's the positions I'm most acquainted with. I understand the most. I played wide receiver in high school. I played cornerback first couple years of high school, and then I moved to safety where I played that my two years in college. But those are my two favorite positions to watch because I love the one-on-one chess matchup at all press coverage, watching a press release or a press, um, a press coverage DB, two of my favorite things in the world. I love watching the transitions and how those guys move. So, And I just love how there's so many different ways to win at both positions that it makes it really interesting to watch how these guys win. And it's the reason those guys are my favorite to watch because there's no one way to do things. There's always multiple different ways to win at those positions. Uh, the, both of them, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. This for me was one of the hardest. That, you're talking about like yeah. what I accomplished. That 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 was that was easier than me trying to pick my favorite positions because <laughs> I'm a guy when it comes to scouting and and you know I kind of talked with you already about when you came aboard here, Blitz. I really am firm in the belief that you know you might have a preferred position that you want to scout, but mm-hmm. you need to be at least confident across the board to be oh, able yeah. to you know at least get close on your evaluations. You might have a preferred like a receiver and cornerback. But this one's really hard for me, so I, I couldn't narrow it down past three. First of all, this quarterbacks, you know, we mm-hmm. it's that's an easy you know layup that I can throw because if you don't have a quarterback, you're not going to compete in the NFL. So to me, yeah. it's it's finding the guy, you know, that are the the Russell Wilsons per se that got slept on because of his height. For me, Kyler Murray was one of my favorite players to evaluate. Patrick Mahomes the same way. So fun. And um, we'll get to that maybe here in the next topic, but. Mm-hmm quarterbacks for me it's just because there's a litany of ways you can win you can win with precision you can win with arm strength or velocity type passers you could win with athleticism you know there's a variety of ways now because the way the nfl culture is adapted to a lot of the college players coming in so to me i love different tastes as a quarterback and and trying to evaluate and figure out who it is and if you get really good at evaluating quarterbacks you're going to get a job somewhere whether it's cfl xfl or nfl because um, you're going to make somebody look really smart with quarterback evaluations (laughs) Um, my second favorite you know you're talking about receivers to me tight end tight end to me is is one of the three most important positions i think on an offense anymore especially in this day and age if you have a guy that can block one-on-one or chip in on pass protection but then also run down the seam and catch passes like Travis Kelsey, like a receiver, or run after the catch. How can you match up with that guy? Do you have a safety that can line up with him? No. Do you have a linebacker that can stick with him? Oh, he's like six foot one. Oh, this guy's six five, running down the seam on you, <laughs> skying over you. So to me, tight ends are also another thing. The versatility just astounds me. Um, I sometimes get hung up on the old school blocking tight ends. Um, yeah. and, and that'll be a reason why I think I, I'll say I busted on one guy that's been that's been trending in the right direction uh, two seasons ago. Uh, but tight ends to me is one of the other ones. And I'd be definitely remiss if I don't mention linebackers. I'm a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. We live and die by linebacker play, uh, oh, yeah. whether it's edge rushers at the outside linebacker or inside linebackers. Um, you can win in a variety of ways. You could be thumpers. You could be pass coverage guys. You could be edge rushers linebacker play is always exciting for me to watch oh yeah definitely honestly linebacker play is one of the ones i struggle to watch because i'm not super familiar with the position i'm starting to learn more of it you got to watch videos you got to read you just got to watch tape as well but linebackers can definitely be fun to watch because i just love to see a linebacker just find a gap streak through it just like a running back and just attack and just attack it's so fun to every and then whenever you actually get to see a guy lay the wood on somebody legally you're like This is like 1970s era <laughs> football. Let's get you get your route up like you want to go chess with oh, yeah. somebody. So oh, yeah. that's always the one thing. That's for definitely. Me. Oh, definitely. So we're gonna move on here real quick. We've been talking about ourselves as evaluators for a pretty a pretty little bit of time here. But we're gonna move on. We're gonna talk more about this show and what we're gonna bring as a whole. I'm gonna drop it off to Roy real quick because this was his vision as always. He's the one with the He's one with the big brain here. I'll go ahead and let him go ahead and talk about what our show is going to look like for the most so, part. So, I mean, you kind of already get a taste. It's going to be more of a laid back type of approach. Um, as you can kind of tell with our happy hour that we have before, I want to kind of bring a flair like that because I think a lot of scouting podcasts get a little too hung up on 
on you know sticking to script and saying oh we got to watch tape here and there and blah 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 no we wanted to kind of flavor it more along the lines of you're getting your scouting fix but you're also getting maybe a little bit of a matt miller type approach as well where it's a little bit more laid back and and you can chit chat and ask some questions and we can we can get into having some fun as well about the scouting because it's all fun um to me I not only want to inform you of the players here, but I also want to make you a, a better scout if you're the one listening out there. Or if you're a fan that's just listening, I want to make you more familiarized with the process, whether it's you know terminology that maybe you're not familiar with, maybe you need some help like Zach was saying here about linebacker play. Maybe we could dive into that, about responsibilities and whatnot at some point. Um, but I definitely want some fan interactions so that we can get some questions in here on a week-to-week basis. We are going to try to do one, one once a week here and meet with you guys. Mm -hmm. Um, we're going to be doing franchise by franchise evaluations. And when we say that it's, we're going to give you the breakdown on what kind of picks they're going to be having for that draft class. Uh, maybe some fits, especially, um, player wise that scheme fit, um, and, and team needs specific for each team. So we're going to probably pick one of them probably each episode here. Once the season wraps up and we have a, have a group of people that aren't in the playoff race that we can get Mm -hmm. started on. Um, we are going to get into, um, we're going to start identifying players that we think, uh, especially not only by us, those we're watching, but maybe the other people that are out there in the media and the industry that are buzzing on that we think are going to be trending towards being a boom or a bust player. And we're going to kind of state the case about that, why we think so. Um, and we're going to do some player spotlights. So that's that was kind of the things I'm kind of portraying in there. I know, Zach, you got some ideas too you want to throw out there uh, to everybody. Oh, yeah. So we really want to get you guys, the audience involved, and as this grows and grows, we'll get more and more people. But we want to get you guys the hot takes in here as well. We want to hear them. We want to discuss them. So we'll probably have a couple of little segments here and there dedicated just hot takes, us kind of figuring out whether it's a good take or not. That's kind of the fun That's kind of the fun part about including you guys. We're going to have guests. That's the big plan here. We're going to get a bunch of people from around the community, the draft community, whether they're actively a part of – probably won't be actively a part of NFL franchises. I don't think they're allowed to talk to us. <laughs> But um, not till guys actively in NFL media, <laughs> guys actively in the um, NFL media, guys a part of draft Twitter. Just we're gonna have some fun with that. We'll have fun topics there, but we're definitely gonna have guests as well. Then we're just gonna be positional breakdowns. For one thing, is one thing I'm excited about. We're gonna give a little bit of a breakdown, our top five, some of our favorite guys, some of our least favorite guys from those groups. Um, draft news and college stuff is going to be a part of this as well because we can't talk about the NFL draft without talking about college. You'll see some of that later in this episode here. And then we're just going to have fun. I mean, that's kind of the big thing here. We often forget. I see it a little bit on Twitter. We're here to have fun. We're here to have conversations about a sport we all love. we got to remember it's a game. we got to remember that we're not the ones making money here just yet. And when we make money, maybe we can take this a little more seriously. But we're just here to have fun. Don't take the show too seriously. Don't take the takes we make too seriously. And if you want to roast us a little bit for some of the takes, go ahead. Just realize we're all doing this in all good (laughs) fun. Bring it. Hey, and and on that note, let's have some fun, Zach. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit here. We were talking about talk a little football. Well, before we transition (laughs) to our college shit. Oh yeah. Who's who's some of your 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 busts that you've had? I know you haven't done this a long time, but I know you've you've been watching the draft for a long time, so. Maybe if you oh. haven't been able to evaluate them per se, who are some guys that maybe you really love maybe the last few years that, that you know, just didn't pan out? Oh, yeah. So um, some of the guys I really love that didn't pan out, I'm just going to go back. Most of the Panthers fan, but Kelvin Benjamin was a guy I was really excited about coming in um, just because I was like, Panthers needed a receiver in that draft. I was like, hey, we need a guy. And Kelvin Benjamin came and I was like, he had a really good first year. And I was like, Oh, he's the guy. And this is before I knew a ton about football or the position as a whole. And then he just didn't work out. It was a size thing. It was a movement ability thing. It was a weight thing. Definitely. <laughs> I remember one time <laughs> I remember it was on the sideline. I think it was a bills game An announcer. I don't remember who it was. The announcer said that guy's one, um, one Bojangles biscuit away from being the tight end. And I remember I almost died <laughs> from that. Cause that was one of the funniest things I've ever heard on a live broadcast, but he's definitely one. Then there's, couple other guys I can't remember off the top of my head but definitely there's guys out there where I just I remember being fans of them throughout the process hearing about them I was like oh that's a guy I'd like to have and then just I see him now in the NFL I'm like I'm happy I wasn't evaluating put that take out there on Twitter just yet so 
Uh, oh, hey, yeah. hey, sometimes it's good to have a little piece of humble pie. I'll, I'll throw out a couple oh. of my busts that I've had here. Um, I'll give you maybe one or two from, from Blitz time and then also from whenever I was scouting for Russ. Uh, from Blitz, I've only been with uh, scouting the last two seasons. Um, last year, I was absolutely high on two players, Sewu Alana Lua and also Anthony Gordon. I love both oh, yeah. of them players, but neither one have, have seen much success at all. Like I said, can't say I'm, they're bust yet. They may have not got their opportunity, but two guys that are trending in the wrong direction. Oh, yeah. um, one of the guys, uh, t- my first year here that, I, that I'm, I'm taking a little crow on is Noah Fant. I was very low yeah. on him because I hated his blocking, still do, uh, but his pass catching prowess definitely makes oh, yeah. up for it more than anything. I think I had like a mid third, fourth round grade on him just because I, I like I said, I'm a sucker for an old school uh, oh, tight yeah. end that's more the blocking type. But uh, it's it's something that I, I just can't, I can't get past. Uh, and another guy that I can honestly say, and this one might get me a lot of crow, but I know there, you know, there's a lot of guys that are out there that had the same opinion. Hakeem Butler. I actually had him mocked to the Steelers in the first round. Um, and he went to Hawaii, I think, in the fifth round or the fourth round to the Cardinals. Has yet to still make it. But he was just a freak athlete. Kind of like you're saying with Benjamin, although he's he wasn't the the biscuit yeah, away yeah. from being a tight end. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I'll, I'll be, I'm will be i with you, though. I love Kelvin Benjamin when he came out of Florida State. I'm a combative catch guy. Um, so when wow. I seen a big guy like that in the red zone, I'm like, yeah, sign me up for him. You know, but uh, – <laughs> can't get in and out of breaks when you're about 270 um yeah so i know <laughs> there that's a couple guys and then when i was with russ one of the guys i absolutely loved was hercules mata um i loved him for washington cool, state man. i you know he's one bad mata Afa. <laughs> i always love saying it and i still have yet to see him have any success although i think he's kind of miscast as a three tech i'd like to see him as a outside linebacker um but uh hercules mata Afa and also caitlin balage I was a big Balazs fan from Arizona State. He's look. He's he looked better with the Chargers, but yeah, he doesn't but give me a lot of hope. Very good. <laughs> Has, hasn't gave me a lot of hope. Uh, I think I had some shades of Le'Veon Bell from being a Steeler fan, mm-hmm. wanting that to be, and it wasn't. So, uh, but oh, yeah. uh, let's get back to who's your booms? Who's your guys? You can pound your chest and say I got that one. So one of the guys I remember pre-draft process, I was. This was before I was into it, but Terry McLaurin, I saw somebody talk about Terry McLaurin. I went and watched some house state tape, Terry McLaurin, just randomly on the spur. And I watched him. I was like, this guy looks like he might be good. I wasn't like hundred percent down, but I was definitely on the hype train of Terry McLaurin and he's boomed. Definitely. He's outplayed his draft stock. He's probably one of the best receivers in the NFC East. I mean, he's a fantastic player and he's one of the type of players that I've started to really like lean towards when it comes to wide receivers, those guys that get separation, those guys that are fantastic route runners. And he's definitely proved to be those. Oh yeah. He's, he's a stud. That's, that's definitely a guy. Yeah. You definitely want to say you hit on McLaurin. Um, For me, I'll throw you out like a few of them here just because I have a little bit of a track record last year. One of my guys, and and you'll love him here. One of your Panthers, Jeremy Chin. Um, I seen him in person. Um, I remember sending Jack a, a clip about, uh, his highlight tape that, that I just wanted to get him exposed to it and you could see him lighting people up and oh yeah he did not he did not disappoint in person down there in Mobile he was just excellent he looks like an up and coming superstar in this league and and I actually I think I had a first round grade on him then in 2018 my two guys I I started it from be even before we started scouting my first couple of experiences and looking the tape of him um, I had to take that Kyler Murray was going to be the number one overall pick. Um, I think it was November, and a lot of the guys at Blitz, that was my first year of being here, I finished up a report on him as one of the highest evaluated that I've ever had. Um, He was right up there, I think, about three reports down from Russell Wilson and Patrick Mahomes, uh, if I go back through my annals of history um, and and when I was writing up stuff. Different grading scales, of course, but... um, Uh but, yeah, Kyler Murray was one I loved coming out, and he's, he's making me look smart. And the other one, Max Crosby. Max Crosby, I had oh, an yeah. excellent report on him. I think it was like a, a second-round grade, uh, but I actually mocked him uh, that year to the Rams in the first round. 
I know Rob Rob was excited whenever I got to tell him about him. And then he exploded <laughs> with the with the Raiders, and he's like, "Dude, you were smart." And I'm like, "I try to be." So, um, <laughs> but uh, that was one of them. And now, when I was working for Russ, there was a couple guys. Uh, Philip Lindsay actually had a third round grade on, I believe, uh, back in the day when he was at Colorado. Loved his tape. And then my boy Mike Hilton. Uh, for some reason, I was scouting Ole Miss for Russ at that time, and I kept watching the entirety of the game. And this guy just kept flashing. I'm like, he's just this tiny guy, but, man, he plays like a lion out there. Mike Hilton, I, I remember, I think I gave him like a fifth or sixth round pick, but I should have gave him like a third just because he was terrible in size. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, there was a couple guys there that I, I, I think I can beat my chest on. But, hey, we all make mistakes, but you got to take your victory lap when you get them. That's just a few of them there. But it's always fun oh, to yeah. go back and look and see, like, man, I like that guy. Like, But then you look oh, back yeah. and you're like, I hit on that guy, though. So. Oh, yeah, definitely. So we got a couple comments before we move on. Um, Rob Rob's wondering when he's going to make the show. I mean, <laughs> we'll definitely see. We should probably get this going off the floor first, but we'll definitely get you on it at some point, Rob Rob. We can always – we always need a person, personality like Rob Rob at any point. Well, sure. He says um, Vinny Curry's a guy he missed on. Definitely can see that. And then Jack says congrats on the show. Appreciate it, Jack. And then – Rob Rob's out here saying he had Lamar as the best QB in that draft class, which, I mean, he's been right so far. The rest of the guys, Baker's been good. He's been on and off. I'm still a little bit on the end. I'm not as big of a Baker fan as some others, but Darnold and Rosen definitely not been near Lamar Jackson at all. So Lamar Jackson, I'd probably say, has been the best guy from that class. He definitely has. And and, and then going back and looking at my grades, Baker was my fourth quarterback. Um, as bad as that sounds, I, I'm still just not sold on Baker Mayfield. Um, yeah. I, I don't know why it is, but it's like one of them gut things, like I told you before. Josh Rosen, uh, when he came back, I believe it was the game against USC, I was sold on him. And it was just, I, I have a hard time saying that Rosen is a bust right now. Um, I had some high grades on him. That was pre-blitz. Um, I also had Sam Darnold. I can remember writing his report up for Russ because I had the Pac-12 that year for him. And I think one of the uh, final sentences I wrote in there was like, he's one of the most um, pure quarterback talents I've seen since starting evaluated. And his ability to throw without even setting his feet is Brett Favre-esque. So uh, that's high, <laughs> high accolades. I mean, oh, yeah, definitely. But, the, thing with, the thing with Sam Darnold for me, and I have to say that, um, at least from like an NFL standpoint, I was a fan of him moving into his second and third year. Um, but the turnover problems he had his last year at USC yep. have definitely come in because you can see the arm talent. You can see the ability to throw off platform. He has some highlight reel throws. It's just the consistency part and the decision making that's really hurt him. I don't know how much of that is Adam Gase in that very bad offense and how much of it is him. It's going to be really interesting to see if he ends up in a different situation. I'd love to steal see him the Steelers, oh my goodness. for example, <laughs> as per year or or for the um, or the Colts to take him up, yep. pick him up for like a year and see what happens because I really do think he deserves a second shot. It's just a matter of like how much of those bad decisions is Sam Darden and how much of it is that offense? How much, how much offensive line help has he had too since he's been there, to be honest? No, NFL starter quality lineman in front of him. There, there hasn't been a lot. You can maybe say one per year, um, and that's not making excuses because you know sometimes if you get drafted high in there, you're going to play on bad teams, but – you know, it, you're talking about a fit with the Steelers or Colts. If you put him behind one of those offensive lines with that weaponry, I, I don't think you're talking about him being a bust right now. And it goes back to that point, like we were talking earlier. Specific right. fit. If it's not scheme fit and a bad situation with front office and, and, and franchises and where they're at, he might be a player in the second contract that's that makes you look like a smart GM for getting that at a cheap me. cost. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Rob Rob's saying – Having a feeling Darnold is a patriot. Oh, don't you don't speak that, don't speak that into don't existence. I hate <laughs> that. I love Cam, first of all, so I'll always be a Cam guy. I don't think the sport is good. I think it's put him in a lot of bad situations. But if you can pick up the younger quarterback with that has the talent, even as a Cam Newton fan, I've got to say you pick him up on that cheap contract because, I mean, getting Sam Darnold in there would not be a bad thing for Bill Belichick to just give it a shot, especially if he's not going to be in the position to draft a top three quarterback this year. Which it would be smart because, um, you know, they're looking like a mid-first round. If you can get him for a second or third, I believe they're going to have two extra third-round picks because of compensatory projections. Oh, yeah. 
if you can flip a third for him, if that's all you, can, if that's all the Jets could get, it'd be worth it. Maybe Take him or up. maybe it's a late it. second oh, yeah, round. Def- so we went to the football stuff a little bit early. Thanks to Rob. Rob, appreciate that. But now we're going to get into the college stuff. We're going to talk about these conference championship games and some of our favorite matchups, our favorite players, and then we'll get into some other college football stuff here in a second. But, Roy, what's your favorite matchup this week team-wise? To me, Big Ten football here, the championship game with Northwestern, um, how well they're coached. I mean, they are so assignment sound. They are not out of place. Uh, Their cornerback play has been excellent. Uh, I'm just really impressed. I believe it's Peyton Ramsey's their quarterback. He's been playing well this year. Um, Ohio State is legit, though. They have talent all over the place. Oh. Whether it's a corner, defensive line, linebackers, there's three of them that are probably going to be drafted. You have Justin Fields. It's everybody's talking about is the the two to Travis Lawrence's one. Not saying I'm oh, in yeah. that group, but uh, you have Chris Olave on the front, Master Teague, uh, Tracer. I mean, you could let's go on and on. This is just a list oh, yeah. of players. It's going to be, and I'm not crapping on Northwestern's talent base, but it's almost going to be. Pure athleticism versus, you know, technique and, and flawless type coaching and which is going to win out here. And I think it's going to be a close game more than what people are thinking. And I, I, I'm just intrigued by some of that matchups. I, I, the name is oh, yeah. excluding me right now. I think his name is Newsom, the cornerback for Northwestern. Um, he is might come out. I think it's Greg Newsom. Uh, I think he's going to be coming out. There's talk that he might declare. He's probably going to be matched up with Chris Olive, and it's – that's going to be an interesting matchup one by one. Oh, yeah. I just think, personally, when I talk about that matchup, I just think Ohio State's talent gap between them and Northwestern is going to be too big because you can have your best corner on Chris Olave, CO2, but then they have that young guy. I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he's a, he's a sophomore this year, and he's going to be a top receiver in the draft probably next year or the year after that because he's fantastic. He moves really well, and I can't remember the name of him. He's, he wears number five, but... Yeah. He's really, really good, and I don't know if they have a second corner that can match up with him or stop Justin Fields. So I think it's going to be a bit. Personally, I think it's going to be a bit of a boat race. I don't think Northwestern's going to be able to really hang with Ohio State, but I'm hoping it's a good game because I always want good football. Oh, definitely, definitely, and don't sleep on Patty Fisher there in the middle, uh, trying to oh, yeah. spy on Mister Fields. There, he's a very assignment sound player. Great tackler, and he's going to be playing a key part in trying to bring down Sermon and, and Teague out there running the football oh. downhill. Oh, yeah, definitely. I'll go into my favorite matchup now. Um, Tulsa versus Coastal Carolina. I'm a <laughs> sucker for a group of five. I love um, – I always love seeing Coastal play. I love their triple option attack. That includes a really good passer in um, McCall. Mm-hmm. He's actually a really good quarterback. I remember seeing Seth Galina um, for PFF. He's a guy I really respect with his football knowledge and stuff talking about how that offense could actually probably give a lot of these bigger schools trouble just because of how it's how it's managed and the fact that they have a top 20 passer in college football and McCall along with this very potent triple option attack, which would be really fun to watch. Now, I think Coastal Carolina wins. Tulsa has that fantastic defense, though, with their linebacker, Zayvon Collins. They have a couple guys, I think it's Jackson Player or something like that. I can't remember his first name but i know his middle age player in the middle of that d line that's really good it's gonna be really fun to watch that offense versus that defense yeah coastal uh they broke my heart whenever they beat byu although that was <laughs> probably the game of the year um but uh i i love teron jackson on their defense um i think he's one of the most slept on edge rushers in the entire class um they also have uh i think his name's dj hayden or payton he's an interior defensive lineman as well you want to be keeping your eye oh, yeah. on he's a good penetrating type uh pass rusher there um not too bad at two gapping when he's he's asked upon it but their defensive line is legit and the way they swarm to the ball oh yeah whew, that's gonna be that's gonna be a big time matchup i can't wait to see they got a little edge to them too. oh <laughs> yeah uh the, the, the mullets versus mormons and they're willing to throw down with them and, oh yeah uh, but zavin collins you mentioned him for tulsa i think uh a lot of people they were talking about dylan moses before the season and a lot of these other mm-hmm. linebackers Zayvon Collins might be in the in the top twenty discussion once uh, if he declares and he talks and he he talks the talk and walk the walk. Eric, if you watch his tape, oh, yeah. he is equally proficient in pass coverage as he is rushing the passer and also in run defense. And he's six four two fifty. He can run like a gazelle. And he can move. Guys can't. Guys ain't can built move, like yeah. that. And you get freak athletes like that. It, it definitely the cream re- rises to the top. 
Oh yeah, definitely. Um, that's going to be, I know that you said that was your favorite prospect to watch and you just gave your little spiel about him. So I'm going to talk about my favorite prospect to watch this week. It's actually going to be Trevor Lawrence. It's a little bit of a cop-out answer, but I really want to see him against this Notre Dame defense. It's going to be probably the best defense he played all year. And since he didn't get to play them the first time around, I'm really excited to see what they do, what he does against them the second time around. And if his quicker decision making probably than DJ, DJ, ooh, yeah, I, I can't say his <laughs> DJ last DJ Scrabble. Really bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, played pretty well against him last week. Last time they played, I am really curious to see if Trevor Lawrence can give them that edge or if Notre Dame's going to pull this out and take the um, – be what ACC. Hey, and I'm I'm with you. That's gonna be um, a a terrific you know litany test for uh, litmus test. Oh, excuse yeah. me for what his draft stock can be because that that Notre Dame defense has quite a few NFL type players. Um, their front seven is is scary with especially with their linebacker uh, Carora. Uh, he's he's sideline to sideline. They got some secondary pieces there. That's gonna be it's gonna be an interesting matchup because is also Clemson defense gonna be able to uh, contain some of the players on Notre Dame? You know Ben Skororak, oh yeah, uh, their receiver that transferred from Northwestern. Um, he's been playing out of his mind this year. He's not the he's not oh, the yeah. greatest athlete uh, per se, although he ha- does have some decent measurables with his vertical jump and, and whatnot. Oh but, yeah, I've heard thirty eight to forty uh, inches, which is crazy. And, 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 <laughs> but he's just one of them gritty guys, and I like his play. I'm not a big fan right. of Ian Book, but in the college game, he, he just seems to have some magic here and there. And I, this could get interesting real quick. Uh, oh, real if quick. the defense is able to just to buoy cool. it a little bit for Clemson, it, you know, Notre Dame could stick there, especially with that offensive line that's it's better than probably oh, yeah. three or four NFL's <laughs> offensive lines. Oh, definitely. It's a really good offensive line. They got some NFLers in there, Liam Eichenberg and Hainsey. the other guy. He plays in the interior, Robert, Robert Hainsey. I can't remember. He's, he is, a, Robert Hainsey, he is yeah. a bad dude. That is somebody you don't want to meet in the <laughs> in an alleyway somewhere. He likes finishing people. Oh, yeah. And before we move on real quick, I want to talk about one more matchup. I'm really curious if this is going to happen. I don't know how Alabama is going to play him, but – I hope we see Patrick Sertain the second against Kyle Pitts. That's what I'm really intrigued by. I think that's a really interesting physical just matchup from a, um, a measurable standpoint. Both are, I believe Kyle Pitts is taller, but Sertain is very physical at the line of scrimmage. I'd love to see that matchup, and I think we'll see it a couple times when Alabama goes against Florida. And I do think Alabama probably runs away with that. I think the defense is just good enough to get some turnovers against Florida. And I think Bama's offense is just going to tear apart that defense. Yeah, that's uh, that running game is going to tear apart Florida. <laughs> I mean, you have Brian oh, Robinson yeah. and Najee Harris. I mean, Mac Jones might not even have to throw the ball, but if he does, he has Devonta Smith. Uh, good luck with that. Uh, but yeah, the Florida. It's I'm with you. I, I love Kyle Pitts. Um, he's he's a unicorn. You're going to hear me say that a good bit. Uh, in the draft uh, scouting realm here, uh, and I'm always of the opinion you draft unicorns, guys that don't fit the traditional molds. Um, he's a big receiver, but he plays tight end, and if he has Patrick Sertan on him, he's able to manhandle him. Um, look out. Um, he's going to cement, my, in oh, my yeah. case, probably a top 10, 15 type status in this draft. Oh, uh, but if not, Josh I... Joby is going to have to pick either Trevon Grimes or Kadarius Tony to pick up here, and that's not going to be an easy match. It's going to be tough. Yeah. I mean, I Josh, Josh Job has some interesting um, traits. He's just not as polished as Patrick Sertain II. Um, I have Patrick Sertain II, or as I like to call him, PS2. <laughs> um, I have PS2 as my um, first-rated corner, actually, right now, at least coming from summer scouting. I loved how polished he was, how good he was at the line of scrimmage. And how fluid he was for such a big guy. He's not the best athlete. He won't wow you with his 40. But the way he just sticks to guys is very intriguing. I love that. And I think it's going to be a really fun matchup with Kyle Pitts. Or even any of the other guys they throw at him. I think he'd probably lock down Trayvon Grimes. But um, I think they're going to put him on Kyle Pitts. And I think that's going to be a lot of fun to watch. So moving forward now, we're going to discuss a little bit my 15 opt-outs that I've covered so far. I rank them. And I'm just going to go through the rankings real quick, and we're going to discuss it a little bit because it's always fun to discuss prospects. Penny Sewell at one, Trey Lance at two, Jamar Chase at three, Rashawn Slater at four, Caleb Farley at five, Gregory Rousseau at six, Javon Holland at seven, eight of Ambry Thomas at eight. There's a bit of drop off there. Javon Holland's a second round grade. Ambry Thomas is a fourth. Demonte Coxie at 
at nine, Sage Surratt at ten, Thomas Graham Jr. at eleven, Warren Jackson at twelve, Jamon Osmond at thirteen, Kerry Vincent Jr. at fourteen, and Paulson and Debo rounding out the group at fifteen. So that ranges from an early first round grain in Penny Sewell to a sixth round grain in Paulson Adibo. I'm curious what your favorite kind of, if you have any takes on that list at all. Uh, one of your guys we talked about here before um, we started here with Sage Sherrod. Um, he's somebody that I actually like his combative catch and his downfield ability. Uh, but I think you hit it right right in the middle there. I think you have him as a fourth rounder um, right yeah. now or a fifth round grade, you know, late four, maybe fifth. Um, I think that's where he's going to wind up. He might get overdrafted just because somebody might get fixated on him. Um, but really, him sitting out this year did him no favors. I think if he was able to show maybe some more route running ability rather than just combative catch ability, I think that might have behooved him to play a little bit. And you hit, you also hit on one of my favorite players, and it's just because he's so technically sound. But he's going to have those those length questions. And that's Rashawn Slater. Um, oh, yeah. I think he's going to be able to play tackle. Um, that's not to say he's he's going to have to be pigeonholed to that. He might be able to be an all-pro oh, yeah. guard, um, but he could also play tackle. I mean, Eric Fisher went number one overall. He didn't have the greatest length. We had a lot of other – you had a guy like Calvin Beecham that started for three different teams and played for a decade, um, and he has 32-inch arms. So um, you have guys out there that, that are the outliers, and if they're able to manhandle people like he did – I don't want to say manhandle. That might be the wrong word. Uh, yeah. He was able to – combat Chase Young probably better than anybody else oh, yeah. that I've seen um, when he was at Ohio State. So that don't just happen by chance. You're a natural yeah. you're a natural pass protector, even if he's got a slide inside. If not, he's going to be my right tackle for the next decade. Oh, yeah. I, I like Rashawn Slater a lot. Um, my big thing was length and lateral quickness. I think he struggles a little bit with the inside move, which is kind of a sign of lateral quickness, struggles a little bit. So I think he'd be really good on the inside. I think he'd probably be one of the better um, guards in the league. So if you already have a tackle, grab Rashawn Slater because he'll finish out your O-line. But if you need a tackle as well late in the first and you're looking for a guy, I would not be mad at all grabbing Rashawn Slater. I think he's proficient enough technically-wise. I have some There are some Ben's concerns that were brought up to me as well that I can definitely see with him. But I think he's good enough proficiency-wise to be an – at least adequate tackle. So if you're looking for a tackle and you need him to slot in there, go ahead and grab him. But I'd prefer him at guard just because I think his ceiling there is higher. Yeah, and uh, we'll touch upon something we talked about uh, pre-show here as well. Uh, you have Jamar Chase there, as I believe, number three. Um, yeah. I'm not so sure. I'm not sold on, on taking a top ten pick if that's where, uh, as everybody's kind of putting him in their, their prospect rankings right now. Um, I'm, I'm not convinced I would take a top 10 selection and, and spend it on him whenever I can maybe backdoor in early second round and come up with his teammate, Terrace Marshall. Um, that's not oh, the yeah. same type of player, but whenever you're looking at value wise, you know, look at the amount of receivers that we've seen the last two seasons and the impact they're able to have in year one. You know, you look at Justin Jefferson, Chase Claypool, Terry McLaurin, you know, you don't have to take a guy in the top 10. I don't want to say that. Oh. You know, it's we sh- we need to start devaluing receivers as much as we do running backs, but whenever you have so many spread systems and so many different play types, I'd be a little leery of maybe taking one in the top ten. Whenever he's not dominant physically, he's been dominant in the SEC, and I think that's what people get fixated on. As everybody yeah. says, SEC is you know the equivalent to some of the worst teams in the NFL. Well, no, they're paid professionals. They get to do that for a reason. Yeah. And they're the best 53 whenever the LSU might have the best 20. Um, and yeah, and exactly. for me, I'm, I'm not sold I would take a top 10 pick and, and spend it on Jamar Chase whenever I could get a guy maybe the second or third round or take one the second and the fourth and maybe be able to equal or outproduce the amount of production that he can get with a top 10 pick. Yeah. I've talked. I've been pretty vocal on Twitter about this as well, about my takes on Jamar Chase. I think he's more of a – I think he struggles a little bit at the line of scrimmage. He lets guys get into his chest a little too much, and he loves this little like lean back and swipe move that he does a lot where it allows the guy to get into his chest, and then he just swipes the hand away. He tries to get him leaning, but he really struggled against PS2 when he tried to do that same move because PS2 is way too patient for that. So he'd have a set, he'd jab his hand, he wouldn't lean to get it, and Jamar Chase would do that same move, 
and then he'd still be right there. So I think it's something that he really kind of struggles with is letting guys into his chest too much. And then I just worry about his route running ability. I don't think he's proficient in enough routes to really be effective in that category, especially since he's not a true speedster as a downfield threat. He is really good at the catch point. I'll give him that. He has great focus on the ball. He almost always comes down with it. I just worry that I always worry that that trade is not very translatable to the NFL. And I think route running speed and the ability to get off the line of scrimmage are a lot more translatable. So I'm really worried about his main trait, getting the ball after getting the ball in the air being translatable. And that's why I have him as a late first. Cause he's still a really good receiver. Right. I have him. I have him compared to Marvin Jones. I think he's going to be a really good wide receiver too in the league. I just don't think he has what it takes to be a wide receiver. Yeah, and I'm kind of on the same wavelength there. It's not that I want to sound like I'm trashing on him because he is a quality prospect. I'm just saying I oh, wouldn't yeah. I wouldn't be willing to take a top ten pick whenever I can get a yeah. different positional need that you're gonna see the drop off a lot quicker, like an edge rusher, a cornerback, um, you know, a quarterback even per se. If I can get Jamar Chase in the twenty, you know, maybe eighteen to twenty two, maybe twenty five range, I'm a happy camper. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm oh, yeah. willing to take that every day of the week. It's just I'm not willing to take a top ten pick whenever there's other guys at different positions that are harder to fill for him. And and to me, separation skills is the most important thing when it comes to be a receiver, um, even more than height. You know, I look at a guy like Antonio Browns. I'm a Steeler fan, even though he went. Um, but uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> for better course of almost a decade he dominated the nfl and what was he five foot nine maybe five foot ten if you see him in person yeah. 180 pounds he could get off a of press he is just dominant he had the balance and the separation skills to get in and out of his breaks and route running oh, yeah. ability those three things are the most key things to me when you're looking at receiver not saying there isn't a time and place for size and speed and everything like that but translatable oh, yeah. skills as you were hitting upon you know yeah and that's my big concern there one of the guys that I'm actually really excited for that. I think, once again, probably not a top-tier elite prospect. And I would love to – I don't know if you've watched him yet, but Ambry Thomas is a guy I'm really excited about because I think you draft him late because he's not going to kill at the combine. He's not going to surprise a ton of people with his measurables. But I think he's a type of guy that gets it at the line of scrimmage and understands how to play man coverage well enough and consistently enough to be a good CB2. I think he's a guy that – when you draft him, you put him in your lineup. He's gonna play pretty well for a for a freshman or not a freshman, a rookie corner. And I think you can slot him in. He'll play well and he'll play well throughout his contract. He's not a guy you're gonna pay top tier money in the future. He's not a guy that's gonna lock down wide receiver ones because there's a lack of athleticism there that worries him a little bit of lack of burst. But he's got smooth hips. He's very good at the line of scrimmage. Very patient. And he can be sticky in man coverage, which I like. His ball skills, he's got a little bit there. I haven't. There wasn't a ton of tape that showed elite ball skills, but he's got enough there to make a play on the ball when he needs to. And I just remember I really enjoyed watching his tape. There's some flaws there. His eyes can wander a little bit, but overall he's got really good eyes in zone. He's very good in man coverage for good hips, good footwork, great in transitions. Yeah, uh, we were kind of talking about him before the show here. He really reminds me of Steven Nelson with the Steelers. Um, and he was kind of knocked. They took him in the fifth round, I believe the Chiefs did um, originally. He's a guy that was was very equivalent in man and off coverage. Um, doesn't give up a lot of separation either throughout the duration of the route, which for me, that's what I always look at. If you're equally proficient in zone and man, um, he doesn't have the greatest length, but he's got some dog in him. He's able to get up there at, at the press point if need be, disrupt the timing off the line of scrimmage. But he's also very patient as well if he has to play off and use that eyes. He's very disruptive at the catch point, whether he might not come down with the, the interception numbers that you may want. You know, Steven Nelson never really had a big-time numbers, you know, like Xavier Howard with nine. Um, but he's, okay. he's come down with about two to three per year. Uh, he gets the ones that he should. But he's really good at getting the pass breakup. He's he's good at anticipating the route concepts. He you know he's he's proficient in both ways. But he's not going to win you with that forty yard dash time because I believe Nelson ran like a four five four or four five seven. He wasn't he wasn't quick, yeah. but he's he's good enough transitionally wise to carry them down the field. He's proficient across the board. Mm -hmm. He's a quality player and at a quality number two corner. I'll take that, especially in the mid rounds every day of the week. Oh yeah. Definitely. I, th I just think he's a guy that I'm going to kind of latch on to in the future. 
of a guy that I think is just going to stick in the NFL and play not amazing, not great, but he's going to be a value in those middle rounds for sure, especially in his first contract. So we talked a lot about my list so far. I was happy to talk about it. I love talking about guys. But we're going to move a little bit further. The Senior Bowl roster was revealed today. They finally revealed it. There's probably going to be some late additions as we go through the process. But of the guys that were revealed today, what are some of your favorites that you can't wait to watch? Yeah, I'll I'll throw out three names here real quick. Um, One is a very polarizing prospect, um, Jamie Newman. Um, I know it's going to be listed as Georgia, but to me it's Wake Forest because he never put a jersey on at Georgia. Um, this guy has, you know, if we're saying arm talent, arm strength. He's got all the all the different ingredients you want in a quarterback. He also has the RPO ability and the scrambling ability. He's got the size. Um, but we haven't seen him play for almost over a year. Um, and that Wake Forest system, they asked him to throw a lot of nine routes and down the field. It wasn't a lot of, you know, progressional type uh, throws. It was a lot of one one read and, and throw the ball. Uh, but he's going to be an interesting guy that if you could get in that second tier, maybe that day two system, and you have a veteran quarterback like the Steelers, you said about the Colts, you know, maybe the Falcons that are looking to upgrade down the road, the Lions, uh, if you don't get a guy in that first first round. Uh, Jamie Newman's going to be a very polarizing process uh, uh, prospect throughout right. the process. And I think if he has a, a big time showing here, he could sneak in. Not saying he's going to. He could sneak into the back end of the first round because of the fifth year option. Just the ability to keep him at a lower contract. Yeah. Um, he could be that guy that could be your fifth quarterback if you sneak him in there. Yeah, I'm not so sure on that. I'm going to be a little bit behind on that. But he could definitely maybe, I would say maybe sneak into the second or third rounds late in those. I just, I'm not seeing the first round hype there, but that's just me personally. But um, go ahead and get to your um, your other two. Sorry, uh, no, about that. you're good. You're good. Two of these other guys are uh, if nobody's really familiar yet. Zach is a part of the. Uh, oh, he's pointing the wrong direction. He's our one of our Pac-12 scouts for blitz, um, and he's gonna mm-hmm. love two of these guys. Demetric Felton, um, the running back receiver oh, yeah. from UCLA. He's just so dynamic in space. They line him up at the slot, and he's actually really impressed me with his running ability. So I, I really kind of comp him to a Naheem Hines, who I think a lot of people get hung up in his pass-catching ability, but he's a pretty impressive runner when he gets the opportunity between the tackles as well. So those guys are both speed merchants, kick return ability, great passing ability in this new wave of the spread systems using a variety of ways. I like versatile skill sets. Uh, I think he could be somebody that could push himself into that day two range possibly with a good performance, not saying second round, maybe not third round range. Uh, and then finally, one of my favorite guys, Elijah Molden. Um, I love his his skill set. He just reminds me so much of Mike Hilton. He's such a secure tackler, sticky in coverage, great blitzer, ball skills. He always just seems to be in the right place at the right time. I love Elijah Molden. Oh, yeah, I'm a big fan of Elijah Molden, too. After I watched him over the summer, I actually, as we talked about this early, um, before the show, but I tweeted out, I was like, are we sure Elijah Molden is not better than Sean Wade? Because I I watched Sean Wade, little work, and I just think that's still showing out today. I do think that Elijah Molden might be a better overall player. I'm not going to say prospect, because I think that Sean Wade's probably a better athlete overall, and I think that kind of leads into the, like, future how he plays in the future, probably a year or two down the line. I think we might say Sean Wade's better. But right now, if you're drafting a guy to play right now, I'd probably pick Elijah Molden over Sean Wade, especially even in the nickel, just because I think he's more polished right now. I'll go ahead and get into my guys real quick that I like. These are a couple of guys I've been pounding the table two, for for a while. Shaka Tony is one of them. I'm really excited to see him. Really good burst off the line of scrimmage. That first step is like a lightning, and he's starting to build those counters to his already really good outside at rushes. So it's really good on this list. I'm excited to watch him play, especially in one-on-ones. Shai Smith is a guy that I've been pounding tables for for a while. He's going to be a mid-round guy. I'm not going to say he's going to be a top two-round pick or anything like that. He's probably going to be a fourth or fifth-round guy. But he's a guy that comes in. If you want a slot receiver, a lot like uh, what's his name from the Jets. I cannot remember. It's Jamison Crowder. Crowder. The guy. Mm-hmm. You, uh, you want a guy like him, you pick Shai Smith because he will be a staple in the slot. He'll be a Big catch guy. He makes plays down the middle of the field in contested catch situations. Not the fastest speedster in the world, but he can make stuff happen in yak. And in those short to intermediate ranges, he just finds ways to get open. So that's a guy I really like coming into this. And I had to get a little UNC love in there. I'm starting to cover them a little more in depth. Really enjoying watching the games. Michael Carter is a guy I really like. Really elusive guy. 
makes a lot of stuff happen in the open field. Really, actually pretty good out of the backfield, but he can also run between the tackles a little bit. Part of that one-two punch with Javonta Williams. Really excited for Michael Carter to be here. I want to see how he does out of the backfield catching the ball. See if he can just prove, like, recertify that he can do that. And I'm curious to see how he does more in between the tackles as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm impressed with both them, North Carolina running backs. I'm a Javante Williams oh, yeah. fan. But both them guys, their vision, I'm really impressed with. You know, they, they can run both inside and out. Uh, like you said, Carter maybe more so bounces outside. But I like, I like both of them. They're going to be quality players in the league. Oh, yeah, definitely. So who was a guy, I'll throw it out there uh, since you started us off here, who was a guy that you were kind of maybe a little disappointed that you have yet to see because I know Nagy uh, kind of threw it out there that he has some juniors that are going to be um, graduating. Oh, yeah. They didn't get a chance to announce with it here. So there's a, a few more players to be let out yet. But who was a couple guys or either one or two guys that you were kind of sad to see it wasn't on the list? Um, one of them is Rashawn Slater. I looked up, I think he was a junior last year. I looked up at 2019 and said he was a junior. He's still listed as a junior on the Northwestern website, so I'm not sure if he was graduating this year. But if he was graduating this year, I would have loved to see Rashawn Slater on there, especially since we could just see like how he does in one-on-ones, how he does against some of these pass rushers that are actually pretty good in this group. And I would have loved to see him there. And then Mac Jones. I understand we're getting Kyle Trask here. Mac Jones said he's a redshirt junior on his um, on the Alabama website. So I would have loved to see them there along with um, Kyle Trash just have those two top Heisman candidates. I do think Mac Jones will probably win it. Or actually, I think Devontae Smith should win it. Yes. But that's just me. Um, <laughs> most dominant player probably in college football right now. But those two are the top runners in the Heisman. I would love to see them both, Kyle Trask and Mac Jones, in Mobile. So I can just kind of rip Kyle Trask apart and like say Mac Jones still doesn't have the arm. But that's just me. But I would love to see those two guys. In mobile. Yeah, so for me, I'm going to throw out one guy I've been, like, you were, you were talking about Shy Smith. I know that's one of your boys. Uh, one of my boys transferred as a grad transfer, but he didn't have the greatest season here. Um, KJ Costello. Um, I know lately he's, he's had some injury histories after transferring over from Stanford. He got waylaid again at Michigan's, uh, excuse me, Mississippi State. Um, after having the first game of the year, beating LSU, putting up record numbers, I absolutely love KJ Costello I would have liked to seen him in this type of setting because I just think he's he has that demonstrative demeanor I think he could have had a rise not saying in the first round but he could have maybe made the tail end of the second day he has a lot of tools in the toolbox there that you could work with as a developmental quarterback would have liked to seen him in the equation and finally a small school guy um, I, I love my small school guys Jeremy Chin last year um, Jack Bourgeois and I both we love Ben Barch from St. John's. Um, he was actually one of the best players out in the field last year when we were watching practices. Um, this is a guy from Wisconsin, Whitewater. Uh, watched a few games of him. Quinn Miners, uh, f- freak athleticism, great movement ability, uh, fitting at the second level, being able to block, um, being able to you know just pull trapping and pass protecting. He used great leverage and 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 punching. Uh, was quite impressed with his game down there at uh, Wisconsin Whitewater. I wish we would have been able to see him um, get a chance up there with the big boys. But we'll see. Maybe with an injury or something like that. I believe he got one to the College yeah. Gridiron Showcase right now, so we might get to see him in some sort of all-star game. But Quinn Miners is a guy you definitely want on your radar because he's on NFL radars. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, so – We'll go ahead and move on to this last topic here. Just a real quick, like, college news thing. Kenny Pickett is actually coming back to school for another year, and this is something I could see K.J. Costello doing, for example, because he had a, kind of a tough year. I understand he's been in college yeah, forever. Yeah, he, he, I think he'd be, but... like, 20. He might have Chris Winkie disease. He'd, I think he'd be, like, 26 know, if he'd, yeah. <laughs> he'd stay in there. But, I mean, Kenny Pickett is going back for this year. I could see K.J. Costello doing it due to injury and things like that. But um, all players, including the seniors, have a chance to – Come back to school for one more year. And I think that's going to be really interesting in this draft class and probably possibly stack next year's class as well. Guys coming back for that extra year eligibility. I think it's going to be really interesting. Yeah. And then I, I'm just, I, I'm kind of on the opposite spectrum. I think they're better off taking their talents to the NFL because I think it's just going to, it's going to muck up the system, not only for these guys that are getting, you know, national signing day, the freshmen that are coming in player, you know, we wouldn't have had a Stingley type player maybe at LSU if if we had the same type of situation here with with a cornerback to stay at LSU or something per se like that situation. I think they should 
if you're going to be able to, it's just a confusing situation. A lot of people aren't sure what's oh, happening. Yeah. Um, you know, are seniors going to have to come out like the juniors and underclassmen now and declare by the declaration day? Um, you know, the NFL really hasn't been very vocal and, and open about what, what the process oh, yeah. is. Um, I think it's going to really leave a lot of kids in the transfer portal, maybe without a position or a job where they think that all, oh, you know, I'm a fifth year senior and I think, you know, another program will take me if I go to the transfer portal, if I don't stay in my program now, I think a lot of them guys, you might see in the supplemental draft where they're left out in the cold at this point. Oh yeah. And then they realize, well, I'm not going to get a chance. I better go hop to the NFL this time. So it's just gonna yeah. it's it's a mess in my situ in in my opinion. Oh yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be really weird these next like two years in the draft and things like that. I definitely agree. Yeah. It's gonna be a weird process. Well, real quick before we um, end the show, Rob Rob had a question for us to answer, and then Jay also says hi. What's up, Jay? How's it going, Cuz? But uh, um, he asked, who are a couple guys at different positions that you were just taken away taken away by like blown away with? when you were watching them. I'll go ahead and start so you can think about this a little bit. You have a little bit more experience, so you got a longer database mm-hmm. to pull from. Um, I'll go, I'll start with this year. Penny Sewell, when I watched him, just absurd. The things he does athletically for a guy that his size, he's like 6'4 to 6'6, six, six, I can't remember the exact number, and 330 pounds, but he moves like a tight end. And the things he moves, the way he moves, the way he handles pass rushers, it's just absurd when I watched him. Derek Stingley's another guy. When I watched him, I was like, this guy's this good as a freshman. <laughs> it was absurd to watch him. He should have won freshman of the year over Bo Nix. Yes. <laughs> 100% believe that. But um, definitely a guy that I watched him. I was like, wow, this is a, this guy's not in the, shouldn't, isn't declaring for the draft because he could have after last year. He was that good in 2019. I haven't watched much of his 2020, so I'm not sure how he's played this year. I understand he's had some injury issues, which sucks for a guy like that. But um, Penny Sewell and Derek Stingler won a wide receiver. Actually, DK Metcalf, when I watched some of his tape from college, I was like, how is this guy not a first-round pick? Just the athleticism, pure athleticism as a guy. I'm usually not a height, weight, speed guy, but sometimes it's just ridiculous, too absurd <laughs> to run a 4-3 at 6'4", 225, 235, and still be that mobile. Like I understand he didn't have the greatest three-cone time, whatever, even against press, he still was quick enough in and out of breaks and things like that to be really, really good. And he's gotten even better in the NFL, which is crazy. He's gotten a lot better at his stops and stop and goes, things like that. So DK Metcalf, when I watched him in college, while I watched some of his college tape, just looking back, I was like, this guy should have been a first-round pick. No questions asked. Yeah, for me, I'm, I'm going to take some low-hanging fruit here. I could talk about Kyler Murray because it was ridiculous. I've never seen a quarterback that big be able to have the throwing ability and then have the scrambling ability. Everybody want to talk about his scrambling ability, but he really was a quarterback first. He was His accuracy oh, yeah. was off the charts for me. Oh. Um, and But when I, I remember watching the first tape on Patrick Mahomes, I'm like, I don't need to see hardly any more tape. <laughs> I don't care he's in the spread system. I don't care he's in the air raid. I've never seen a guy be able to throw a ball like this. And I can remember that draft class. Everybody's like, you got to go to Deshaun Watson, this kid from North Carolina. He's he's up and coming. I'm like, why are we not talking about this kid that can take 15 steps back, throw it 80 <laughs> yards, and he couldn't have walked it out there any better and handed <laughs> it off to the guy. And that just being able to see a guy like that come in from an air raid and completely obliterate one of those preconceived notions – I love it. You know, it might be low-hanging fruit, but I can remember watching that. And I'm like, this is my guy, you know, like on draft day. This is Patrick Mahomes no matter what I would have took. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's one guy I can honestly say. That and Ryan Shazier, if you remember him at Ohio State, really? his playmake ability from a linebacker position is devastating what happened to him in his career. I think he could have been a Hall of Fame type projection. Um, uh, dynamic ability, 4-3 speed, legit. Um, in a straight line, and I kid you not, I could I believe it from sideline to sideline laterally. Um, just an absolute ridiculous athlete. And not only that, one of the smartest players that I've ever heard at training camp calling out offensive uh, route concepts and, and pass protections before they're even adjusting. Um, he was just – he was a freak both as a mentally capacity uh-huh. and football intelligence and athletically. So two guys like that I'll throw out there. 
Oh, yeah, definitely. And guy, if we're going to talk NFL guys, real quick, one guy that reminds me of that is Luke Keekley. Just, I love watching his tape because he's so smart. You just see, like, I, lo- I don't even have to watch the play. I just see the stuff before the snap. <laughs> just pointing stuff out. Like, if you could have the audio, I would love to hear the audio of him calling out, like, counter here, counter there. I always love the um, mic'd up stuff of him because you just hear him calling out plays. And it's just so fun to watch. One of the, I personally, one of the smartest players to play in the league in the past 10 years, I think. So he's definitely got to be up there just from what everybody has said about him in the NFL. One of the most dedicated film studies I've ever seen. He's actually working for them now as a pro scout. The mm-hmm. Panthers, he's working with yep. the Panthers now as a pro scout, which is awesome. I mean, I totally understand why he retired health first. He had a history of concussions. He started looking a step slower in his 10th year, which happens as you age. And he was just like, time to t- hang it up. And I totally respect that, and I'm happy to see he's still around football doing what he is. And mark my words, in the next five years, he'll be a GM. Oh, yeah, GM or coach, somewhere he'll, along there, man. He's one of them he's guys be, like Peyton Manning where you know he just gets it, and he's going to be one of the guys that will be a GM somewhere. He's yeah. going to work his way up from the bottom, but that's going to be a guy you're going to want to watch his career track since he's retired, even though we don't get oh, to yeah, see definitely. him play on the field. But the, Hopefully – Hopefully one of those guys we see that's a double Hall of Famer, I hope. So I think I think I know his career was short, but I think just like you can't tell the story of the NFL without Luke Keekley being mentioned in there as one of the smartest defensive players in the league at during that time frame. And then eventually hopefully he'll be one of the smartest GMs because I think that would be a fantastic career track for him. I'd love to see it. Absolutely. I'm I'm excited to see the future there. But Oh yeah, definitely. But hey, well, that's that's all we got, right? That's all we got for this show. It was great having you guys along with us. It was a little bit longer one, but that's fine. We were just talking football for a long time, and I cannot hate it. So Me neither, buddy. Roy, where can they find you? Hey, you can find me on Twitter at, at PreacherBoyRoy. Um, like I said before, in the description down below, go check out if you're a new scout or, or wanting to get to know a little more. Go check out the uh, the link to that podcast with Russ um, and and the other gentleman there, I forget his name now. Uh, that's how bad I am with names. Um, also, go buy your copy of Prospect Encyclopedia for Christmas. Um, you can get a hardback copy on Amazon or Book Baby. Um, you can get PDF, team by team PDF. It's still pertinent information you need to know now and for the playoffs. Yeah. And as I always like to end, Zach, you'll know. Stay humble, be a blessing, buddy. Oh yeah, definitely. You can find me on Twitter, all22addict. It's all22 underscore addict on there. I do post a lot of all22 if you guys want to find it. Um, You can find us here every week. It's going to be a Wednesday show. We're happy to have you along with us. And you know what? Thanks for coming along. Let's out. Peace. Peace.